All right. Well, let's talk about. I mean, I I, I want to talk about the um, the uh, the the 2016 and sort of like how you uh, because there has been you've had a big I think public um, um, reassessment of mm-hmm. of of your role in the context of. I mean, I guess maybe like a different civil war. Was that a civil war? Like, you know, where what during the the, the primary uh, battles, and I tried largely to stay um, out of uh, those uh, specifics. I mean, I was supportive of Bernie, but um, obviously in the general of of, of Clinton. Um, but the, a lot of people got sucked into it super deep. You were one of those people. Um, yes, I was. T- just tell me about that experience. It, looking back on it now, uh, I can see how I did exactly what you're saying, which would get sucked into it. I, I've been describing it as a, as a family fight because largely, uh, I think a lot of people who were in the same place, or generally speaking, we're looking for the same type of America where people had more health care and there were fewer shootings and there was uh, less inequality, ended up getting on different sides of two candidates. And it became, as, as you know, as we all know, so incredibly bitter. Um, but as, as somebody who you know, grew up in a war and, and once you're in the trenches with somebody, you, you stay in the trenches with them, I sort of became that person in the trenches with Hillary and I just was not going to abandon her in the middle of the fight. But what that ended up doing is, I think, making caricatures of a lot of us. And we, we, just, we just went so far in the direction of, of fighting that fight that I think um, it just ended up hurting and causing more pain than it, that, than it really needed to. Primaries can be con- contentious and can be negative, but I think 2016 just went off the rails. And I, and I, and I do believe there, was, there were outside agitators, professional agitators that made it a lot worse. But I decided, Sam, that I just wanted to take responsibility for myself. I can't tell other people how to feel. And I know there are some people who are annoyed with me for, for going through this, this, this transitional phase and reassessing my role. But it's something that I felt I had to do because, number one, I felt that I started getting so far away in terms of how people saw me and things people were saying to me, so far away from who I was, which was, as, as I know you know, because we've known each other a long time, a progressive anti-war activist. I started in politics because I used to be a musician fighting the Iraq war and fighting Bush and fighting uh, Karl Rove and Cheney and those people. And so – for me, it reached a point where I thought, okay, wait, am I seen as some DNC shill who's just uh, being paid to just parrot some establishment uh, line? I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm anything, but I'm the exact opposite of that. I was brought into the Democratic Party to reach out to the progressive community. So part of this was my own personal realization that I, the perception of who I was had moved so far away from who I am that I needed to reconcile that. And the way to do it was to start reaching out to people and just saying who I was and making amends. What, was there was there a moment and and I understand too and and I ask these questions um, because I mean I I've had uh, problems frankly with people who uh, wouldn't give up the ghost for uh, in terms of their support of Hillary but also people who wouldn't give up the ghost in terms of like a narrative they had bought into about why uh, Bernie lost in 2016 and and frankly I haven't had. Um, you don't get the opportunity. I haven't had the opportunity to talk to people who sort of like have had a, at least a, uh, a change in perspective on how they're presenting it. So this, I, I mean, I, I see this as a pretty valuable opportunity just from a generic standpoint, like what, mm-hmm. you know, to understand um, how people get that immersed into it. Because I, I mean, I'm sort of uh, mystified on some level how it gets, cause, because, because, I've seen your work for, you know, 15 years or so more, maybe Mm -hmm. Um, how, when, when you came in uh, to this about issues, it ends up becoming so much about uh, personalities. Was there, was there a moment, was there a moment where you're like, Hey, wait a second, (laughs) because, because it, because it wasn't, you know, you were into this, not just into the primary, but as late as like almost the end of, uh, of 2017, as far as I can remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into two, yep, absolutely. Into you were still talking like Bernie, you know, uh, ruined everything. Um, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. What, what was it? Was it, I mean, was there a moment or was it just over a period of time? 
it was a period of time, but it was it was it was driven by one singular purpose, right? Which is the the I knew how bad the the the, the Trump presidency would be, and it's even worse than I thought it would be because you know not having a single single Republican lawmaker have a shred of decency or patriotism or integrity. Um, maybe that was to be expected, but I think the combination of the two. So, so looking at called where it. we were headed, I called that. that. I called that early on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. You, you, you did. And, and, and you were, and you were right. And look, I knew it too. I've been fighting right, Republicans right. Uh, since 2000, but, but I think the, the, the combination that also to be perfectly honest, the, the unwillingness of the democratic party leadership to fight back with the requisite intensity. Uh, for, yeah, I advocated walking out on the Kavanaugh hearings, right. uh, collectively walking out and it was hinted at even by democratic leaders saying you know this is a sham this is a charade and then i said okay well if it's sham and charade and you're saying that publicly then why are you participating in it so it's not just impeachment is another big issue that i have a criticism but they're even back to merrick garland so i have a lot of criticisms of the democratic party too and disappointments but overall what started happening was i just started looking forward so here i am 2016 still you know still stinging from the 2016 fight it's 2017. Now we're looking towards 18, the, the midterms to 1920, and time is passing. I'm thinking, okay, what happens in 2020 if we're still fighting 2016, three and four years later? And I thought this is going to be a catastrophe for us. It's just, you know, as you say, talking about digital civil war, we, we're going to have a mini civil war within the Democrats, leftists, progressives, et cetera. And I thought, I have to do everything I can to prevent that from happening. So who better to do it than somebody who's a sort of hardcore pro-Hillary guy who's partially critical of Bernie to come out and say, look, we can make peace. I grew up in a place where people were shooting at each other, and then eventually there was a ceasefire and a peace, and they coexist. The Lebanese people coexist, people who were mortal enemies then they did it because eventually you can't be at war permanently. So because you live together. So so that that was my sense that maybe I could play a role, a constructive role. But of course, I've gotten a lot of heat because there was skepticism initially um, on, on the Bernie side. But I have to say, Sam, it's been amazing how many people have sort of welcomed this and reached back out to. And that's been very gratifying. And there are also a lot of people who, who are my former uh in the trenches or Hillary people who many have understood and have come with me and say, yep, we're looking toward 2020. This is great. And then some have been very, very angry at me and say, you're a traitor and you're abandoning us and how can you do this? And, but you know what? Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do and not care about who's, who's attacking you and do it for the, for the greater good. To me, the greater good is defeating Republicans. It's just that simple. Right. Uh, and so let me ask you this. Why do you think so few people have made the adjustments on, on both sides? From 2016, mm-hmm. or, or, or am I not seeing that they have? I mean, that's the thing that's, mm-hmm. I think, uh, very difficult about Twitter is that um, the, you know, I sp- I, is, is a certain myopia, right? Not just because of yeah. who I follow, but Twitter itself. I could follow everyone on Twitter, and I would still have a tremendous amount of myopia as to what's going on. But um, give me your sense of, to the extent of how many have d- turned toward looking towards the future and to the extent that they haven't, what do you think it is that keeps some folks locked in regardless of which side they're on? I, I, I think that uh, people were genuinely hurt. Um, they were attacked. They were smeared. They were, they were, that their, their integrity and their principle was called into question and, and, no, nobody likes that. People get angry. And it is true that Twitter is not fully reflective. I, you know, I'm not one of those guys who says uh, Twitter is not real life. The, Twitter, of course, is real life. The reason I used to, to go back to an early point, you made, I say the non-virtual world is because people distinguish real life from Twitter, which is not the case. Twitter is part of our life, part right. of all our real lives, Facebook, all these platforms. It's just we're, we're now integrated with technology in so many ways. So I say non-virtual, maybe I should say non-digital so, but Twitter is real life, but in some ways, the political fights that happen there are not fully reflective of the wider electorate and people who are less involved. So I think, I think the answer to your question, and I've learned this uh, over this process of the past year and a half, trying to, trying to make peace and bring people together. There are some people looking at me and say, wait a minute, you know, I, got, I got sexist, misogynistic, racist attacks. There's no way I'm forgiving anybody who did that to me. And my answer always is, look, I can't speak for you. I can't ask you to erase what you experienced. And so I'm just trying to lead by example by just doing it for myself. But I sure don't want to 
be the guy who's telling people, you know, forget about the fact that, that, that you were attacked. I, so, so this is, so I'm not sure I can answer your question fully, right. Sam, of, of saying, you know, why other people are doing it. I, I figure the best way to do this is just to do it myself. And if it sets an example for others, great. And if it's just my own personal coming back to where I belong, which is as a progressive activist, then I'll just do it for me. Now is the idea that, uh, we want to, uh, come together to fight the right or is it, is there, do you have a notion that we can all come together? Because that seems to me to be right now, like a, uh, a big theme in this primary. And I don't want to start <laughs> around yeah, no, I I, this war, but, but you know, right. d- there are, there are some of the candidates who are out there going like, I'm a unity candidate. I'm going to, I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Biden saying stuff like this, uh, Buddha judge to a certain extent, although he's, you know, I think he's, um, he's trying to be a little bit more nuanced. Um, uh, Beto to a certain extent was on that early on this idea that, um, we're going to bring people together. Maybe, maybe there's other, uh, you know, uh, 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 candidates who are, who are saying that as well, but those are the more, I guess, prominent ones. Um, I mean, how, you know, how much of your, uh, from your experience, how possible is that? I mean, or, or, or let me put it this way. I mean, obviously you've been through an actual civil war where people came together, mm-hmm. but that didn't happen until like, People started shooting years at later. Each- Yeah, and, and, and there was a lot of shooting that went on in between there. Um, yep. And it's much easier to live with, I'm going to argue with people on Twitter, conservatives on Twitter, and try and you know uh, beat them at the ballot box uh, than it is they're dropping uh, bombs and they're firing uh, rockets uh, you know, right. uh, into my neighborhood. Right. I mean, so w- w- what's your sense of that? I, I, I it's, it's an excellent question, and, it, and it's a very important one, right? Because uh, I think that the idea of unity in this very vague, general, happy, touchy feely way, or we can all come together and just forget everything that's happening, I think is 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 just pie in the sky. I think it's unrealistic, and it doesn't take into account the reality. To me, when you when you fight injustice, which is what I do, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a political expert, really. I used to be a musician. I used to be a music producer for for most of my career, and then I got into politics as an activist, as somebody who just cared. You, you can't. There is no halfway between. Hey, you know, you like kidnapping babies from parents and throwing them to ice cold freezers. You you, you like police brutality. And, and just cops getting away with, with murdering the, the black motorists for doing nothing but just looking at them or just driving. Um, so let me meet you halfway and then we'll have unity. That's, I think that's absurd and it's an insult to the idea of, of, of justice and, and fighting injustice. So now, that said, I, I think it's important that we don't have blanket um, uh, sort of dismissals of an entire segment of a population like they're all exactly the same person. I think... I think that people are different and people approach things from a different place. So what you don't want to do is, is be sort of over the overly uh, sweeping in your, in, in, in generalizations about people and their beliefs. But fundamentally for me, I believe the Republican party at this point, the Republican party leadership specifically is pushing for, for, for theocratic, autocratic, tyrannical, right-wing extremist rule at this point. They have no respect for the rule of law. They have no respect for our Constitution. They want to oppress women and criminalize pregnancy and, and women's reproductive health. They, they, on and on and on. They want to enrich oligarchs by stealing health care from, 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 from sick people. These, these are not people that you meet halfway. These are people you defeat at the ballot box and you overturn their hideous, hideous policies. Now, of course, I have criticism of Democratic Party leaders, as I say, for not opposing it strongly enough. So when I talk about coming together, Sam, I'm not talking about let's all just, you know, this is all, we'll just forget this once Trump is gone and it's all going to be better. These are long standing fights that go back to 200, 250 years, and they're not going to be resolved because we say, hey, let's all come together and be peaceful. We have to fight for justice and we have to institute a, a, a just society. And that takes a tremendous amount of work and may not happen. It probably won't happen in our lifetimes. What's your assessment of what can, I mean, what, it, or, or, or rate for me the different roles that you see or values that you see um, in uh, in fighting the uh, th- this fight, I mean, when you talk about winning this election in particular, but more broadly, um, what 
how much of it is from your perspective a messaging fight or how much of it is from a policy fight i mean so you know again mm-hmm. we have examples in this democratic primary of of different types of messaging you know um, some that are more aggressive some that are like i like republicans uh forgive mm-hmm. me um right and I mean, I think I'm letting my uh, bias against a certain candidate show, but um, <laughs> be that as it may, those are different messaging. And there's also uh, tends to be somewhat aligned with that uh, aggressiveness in the messaging. How aggressive um, from a policy standpoint, like how much do mm-hmm. uh, the candidates feel uh, the Democratic Party needs to offer material benefits to people's lives? Um, right. Uh, w- w- rate those different types of appeals and, and what you think uh, Democrats need to do in, in this coming election. I, I think that from the of course they're tied together. Um, the, the the policy and the messaging and, and and even more than that the posture. You know, one of the biggest problems I've had with Democrats is the posture tends to be defensive about their positions, even though their positions are more popular generally. If you look at environmental issues, climate, things like this, even guns, if you look at, if, if you look at guns, if you look at the actual polling, and I write about it in Digital Civil War, I talk about the polls that show support, majority support for democratic slash progressive issues. So, but somehow Democrats always behave like they're on the defensive, like they somehow have to pander to this so-called, and again, another theme in the book, this, this so-called real American, this sort of rural, white, church-going, gun-toting American who's the, the, the so-called quintessential American. If we appeal to them, we're going to start winning elections. And that's the way Democrats constantly think. They play into these right-wing narratives. So, Pushing good, smart policy is a crucial part. If you t- talk about Medicare for all, if you talk about affordable college, if you talk about $15 minimum wage, all these, the Green New Deal, these are all excellent policies. Some of them need to be worked through by experts to see the, how practical they can be, how they can be implemented. But, but putting forward good progressive policy is very important. But the, the, the corollary to that is understanding how the media and messaging system works in America. One of, the, one of the things that Democrats are so weak on, generally speaking, candidates, and why Democrats lose, we win some elections, but overall the country has moved further, further, and further to the right. So when I look at the, the sweep of the past 20 years, whether or not Obama won, whether or not the, the midterms, you know, we've had some moments in which we've had an electoral victory, but generally speaking, we have gone backwards. Roe Ro v. Wade is, uh, uh, is about to be overturned. All our rights are going away. We have autocracy with Donald Trump as president. So I think the answer is put forth excellent progressive policy, have the courage of your convictions, but also understand how communications and media move around. There is no liberal media, and right-wing media is is programming 30% of the population. I don't think Democrats get that, Sam. My biggest concern is they need to speak to that. So it's it's a combination of all those things and more, of course, and, and just the courage of your convictions. Who do you perceive your audience? I mean, and not just a specific. I'm not just saying you, but 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 people who are situated like you on, um, you know, on social media. Like like wh- like what is the? Um, I I'm I'm totally with you that Twitter is real life. Of course, it's real life. Everything that yep. we go through is real life. Uh, exactly. Um, and and Twitter has some very real applications in the context of. Uh, of of political fights, what do you perceive uh, it to be, and what do you perceive your role in it? Well, I, I you can look at demographic breakdowns of different audiences. I, uh, Twitter gives everybody the capacity to take a, gen- a very broad look at who who their audience is. But I I've never been a fan of segmentation. You know, I've been in in the political uh, trenches for a long time, and I've worked within. I've worked outside the system, inside the inside the system, polling and focus grouping and segmentation, and you know all these different types of ways we slice and dice the electorate. I I, I actually am a believer in, and maybe it's maybe it's naivete in some way. Maybe I, I just I'm idealistic in the sense that I think that a, that a good message can reach everybody. So when I when I go on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere when I go go on media and, and talk, I, I I just try to speak in the the broadest, most general terms. I don't assume everybody's a political expert. One of the things you get in this media elite. 
um, is 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 all these isms and people, you know, dropping terms and ideas and <laughs> philosophers and thinkers. But to me, that's just a little bit too highfalutin for me as a guy who used to be a musician, who used to, you know, who grew up in a war. Who, uh, I just look at it as okay. We all can agree that we need clean air and water, that, that one would want their child to grow up in a world where they're not drinking polluted water, right? That's something that should reach everyone. There, there shouldn't be an adult who, 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 who can't understand the notion of, okay, it's not fair that some hedge fund guy, and, and I'm a New Yorker, is buying a $100 million condo overlooking Central Park, not even living in it, just doing it to show off to some other billionaire, while there are kids who can't afford school supplies, anybody with common sense can look at that and say, okay, that's just not right. It's just not fair. So uh, same with, say, the Tamir Rice case, which I talk about in the book. Here's a 12-year-old boy. When the, the, the cops were called on him because he was holding a toy gun and playing in a park, the caller to 911 said, it's probably a juvenile, it's probably a toy, two or three times. And yet the cops showed up in a drive-by shooting, just literally pulled up and shot the boy to death, left him dying in the snow for four minutes, not giving him any assistance, and then cuffed his young sister who was running to help her brother. And then there were no consequences, none whatsoever. Nobody can look at that and say, oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's not a problem. That should happen in America. So, so the way I look at it is I'm talking to everybody and nobody, right? Whoever's listening, when I go on Twitter and say what I say, I assume any American adult um, can, can understand what I'm saying, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But the, I mean, the number of people who are there on Twitter who are talking about politics, presumably if they're following you, they either really vehemently disagree with you or they generally agree with <laughs> right. you, right? Like, isn't, yeah. isn't it about uh, influencing people who have, you know, more access to the media? I and mean, I, think, it, I believe in... I, well, I believe it reverberates. See, I, to, to me, I, 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 I'll, I'll do a tweet, and then I'll see it show up in some, you know, get picked up by some media outlet talking about an issue. And then I feel like the information flows. If, if you, if, I often use this analogy. If you have a 30,000-foot view of, of America, and you think of information as these sort of rivers of, of, of data flowing around, because we're, we're getting information from Facebook, from New York Times, from, from, from you, from, from podcasts from all over the place, People are exposed to information, and information has a way of moving through the system. And we use the term viral, which is, was an overused term 10 years ago, and it's certainly overused now, but it's, it's, it's understandable, right, the idea of a virus. So you can say something, and it can have like the whole butterfly effect, where a week or two or three later it can end up changing a policy. So, yeah, you are talking to a very limited population, but there can be much wider effects of people speaking up. Also, one thing that's very important to me, because I'm glad you raised this, a lot of people minimize the idea of somebody going on a Facebook or Twitter or, or Reddit and, and speaking out or having their own podcast or their radio show or blogging or whatever they do. There's nothing more important than speaking up about injustice, right? The, the, speaking out is the first step towards taking action and fixing it, and it is an action in and of itself. So anybody who minimizes, oh, you're just, you're just tweeting, what a waste of time. But I know countries where you cannot speak freely or you'll get taken away. You'll disappear. I lived in a place like that during war. You couldn't just speak freely against the government. So, so there's something powerful about being able to go out there and just say, this is unjust. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, Peter Dow... Um glad to uh to um see you um i mean it's a it's uh to glad to have you on and to talk about this stuff and see you um uh you know uh, uh focused on 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 victory whomever that uh that that calls for at the end and uh we also put a couple of links to uh, your pieces uh, in the nation uh, about bernie sanders which i i found fascinating as well and um uh, the book is Digital Civil War, Confronting the Far-Right Menace. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks for what you do, Sam. Very much appreciated.